so uh, my talk will be a bit different because I think uh, uh, we're going from ideas of uh, and concepts uh, to practical applications. I think that's the that's the the final objective. Here I'm going to go and uh, end up with the final objective and actually come back and uh, reflect on the path that we took uh, to get to that, uh, to where we were. So um, we started off, and one of the first things I did in my scientific career was actually work out uh, uh, the enzymology of protein prenylation. And we worked on the pharmacylation of RAS, and then we moved, uh, and we discovered this, uh, uh, this pathway that was uh, dedicated to RAB-GTPA's uh, lipid modification that included uh, an enzyme uh, itself, but also uh, an additional component that we call RAB-escort protein, uh, or uh, REP, that uh, is actually related to RAB-GDI, for those who know about RAB-GTPases and, uh, and, uh, and have heard of this, uh, of this protein. And, uh, and, and, uh, and the first surprise that we had was that uh, really early on, and out of the blue, we realized that the mutation in uh, REP1 uh, originated a human disease. And this was just um, really serendipitous because uh, uh, this disease is a retinal disease, is a next link disease, and, uh, and the reason why uh, there was this connection in 1992 was because uh, uh, this gene had been one of the first ones that had been cloned by positional cloning. So the databases then were not very big. And yet we found a match and we were very excited about this. Uh, what is this disease? It's, a, it's an X-linked disease, a slow uh, a degeneration of the retina that eventually leads to blindness. And, uh, and uh, this blindness has uh, a certain characteristics that are uh, exactly like retinitis pigmentosa, which was the subject of a previous talk uh, here. And uh, unlike retinitis pigmentosa, Croidremia has enough phenotypic characteristics to be called uh, one single entity caused by one uh, single gene, the Croidremia gene or uh, uh, Rab escort protein one. And, uh, uh, and uh, just uh, so that uh, you may not be so familiar with the retina, and retina is a complicated structure. Uh, it's, a, it's a series of, of cells, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and this disease involves progressive degeneration of three layers in the retina, the photoreceptor cells, uh, the retinal pigment epithelium, and the choroid, which is this vascular layer. And altogether, they are compromised uh, and give rise to this uh, unique, uh, distinct uh, um, entity that uh, the doctors called uh, choroidremia, actually for absence of choroid, uh, that's, the, that's where the name uh, comes from. So um, I want to uh, reflect a little bit on, the, on what we did um, until we got to a, a treatment, uh, which I'm also going to uh, tell you about. And the first part uh, in the 90s, uh, we were very much concerned about uh, uh, function and biology of the system. We're still uncovering this, and, uh, and this was, uh, was the most part of our, of our uh, studies were about the biology. And then uh, the first question was, why wasn't this lethal? Because uh, 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 RABs are very, very important, as you know, and uh, this meeting, uh, uh, that was very obvious. Uh, and if RABs are not uh, lipidated, they're not going into the membrane, they're completely inactive. So why wasn't this disease uh, lethal? And uh, uh, really, uh, quite early on, uh, we realized that there was redundancy and that uh, this protein uh, activity was uh, able to be compensated for by a related protein called REP2. So that explained why the disease was, uh, wh why it was, was a disease at all and not uh, uh, a lethal uh, uh, phenotype. And then uh, the other thing that became um, uh, rather obvious was that uh, the, the defect uh, was not uh, a direct consequence of the loss uh, of this protein, uh, but uh, a defect uh, in the effectors, uh, the RAB GTPases uh, and, uh, and all the functions that they provide. So the idea that emerged early on was that uh, there was uh, this function in the prenylation of uh, a RAB, one or more RABs, that led to a deficit in some step in membrane traffic that would then lead to retinal degeneration of these characteristics. 
And so, uh, so really, uh, the first uh, summarizing a lot of data and a lot of uh, work on this, uh, uh, really, uh, chronodremia is a strange disease like most diseases. Um, because it's not even uh, obvious. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a systemic disease. Every cell of the body have, uh, has this process, and yet the degeneration only occurs in these three layers of the retina. And uh, the patients really have no other phenotypic abnormality, although they do have a lot of abnormalities in the cells. The cells are not normal, but it's a subclinical uh, um, defect uh, that, they, that, that they are observed. Then uh, the presence of a compensatory protein, REP2, prevents lethality, and that the disease itself is a result of dysfunction of the substrates, the RAB, uh, GTPases. So what could be wrong uh, in membrane traffic and eye degeneration? or in this case, uh, RPE degeneration or photoreceptor degeneration, lots of things. And here are just some ideas that of things that could be controlled by RAB GTPases that could be uh, important for this uh, phenotype. So we went on uh, with a biochemical approach, uh, and uh, we figured that uh, uh, the way we could crack this uh, pathogenesis would be uh, to try to identify which RAB or RAB that was unprenylated uh, or not particularly um, uh, um, lipid modified uh, in choroidremia cells. So choroidremia cells are predicted to have a pool of RABs or RAB or single RAB that is selectively unprenylated. Um, and then we could uh, identify this RAB by subjecting lysates from these cells to uh, in vitro prenylation with radio-labeled uh, 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 lipid. And then we could observe that while in the normal cells uh, we had no uh, phenotype. This is what we did and we were extremely excited uh, a long time ago. It's one of, one of the very first experiments that, uh, that we did um, uh, in my independent lab now. Uh, and uh, and uh, as, as we predicted, the uh, uh, normal cells have no prenylation substrates available. So the cells efficiently prenylate their substrate. And if you shut down the mevalonate pathway, then all RABs become, before the cells die, we can harvest them, and then we can prenylate many, many different RABs. So this is all selective, uh, all the, the RABs that these, these particular cells are expressing. I have to say, this is 1990-something, and uh, what we had access was lymphoblastoid uh, cell lines, EBV-transformed lymphoblastoid cells. Uh, we had also some access to fibroblasts, but these ones grew much better, so we could do uh, a lot of purification. So, uh, and then we were very excited because when uh, we found this protein that we, uh, that we thought was really, really key to the pathogenesis of this disease because it was selectively unprenylated in the choroideremia cells and could be prenylated in vitro only uh, preferentially by the addition of recombinant REP1 and not REP2. So this is exactly what uh, you would predict uh, that to be uh, the right uh, target. So. And, and then we identify this protein. Uh, we purified uh, on the basis of just uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, hydrophobicity. So the protein was initially uh, uh, um, hydrophilic, and uh, we remove all the hydrophobic proteins. Then we prenylate in vitro, and then we then we try to uh, enrich for hydrophobic proteins, and we could get uh, enough enrichment to get this uh, uh, purification of this protein. It turned out to be RAP27 because it was the ne next one that had not been named. Uh, uh, it was just RAP26 was the last one, and this was RAP27. But the story became very disappointing because uh, eventually we realized that uh, uh, RAP27 had nothing to do with uh, choroideremia, uh, at least apparently, because uh, later on, much later on, uh, we realized that uh, RAP27A knockouts uh, have normal retinas, uh, at least morphologically. They have one phenotype in terms of melanosome motility, but that's uh, 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 sort of something that is not uh, uh, really creating the problems that we're seeing. And uh, we thought maybe there's an isoform, this is an isoform and compensation, but double knockouts also have normal retinas. 
So the question became, uh, could this disease be due to dysfunction of uh, other uh, specific retinal specific grafts? Because I told you we use lymphoblastoid cells. Maybe in the retina there is this magic substrate that uh, is very important, this, uh, this uh, uh, mysterious RAB. Or is there a more general effect of partial dysfunction of many RABs? And uh, I won't have time to go uh, very much into the detail, and I'm mixing up a little bit going back and forwards in time, but um, what, what we were able to do is then uh, later on, and I'll explain you that, we created choroidremia mouse models and, uh, and we were able to actually uh, try to figure out what was going on in the retinal pigment epithelium and that's just because it's a layer of cells that we handle a little bit better um, in, uh, in, in vitro. And uh, so we saw that there was phagosome accumulation. One important uh, function of these cells is to eat uh, outer segment, photoreceptor outer segments uh, uh, in large quantities uh, every day. And so uh, these had a phagocytic defect, essentially, these, uh, these, uh, these cells. Uh, they also uh, accumulate uh, lipofusin and melanolipofusin, which uh, uh, in the same way uh, young mice from, from choroidremia um, have uh, accumulate rapidly um, lipofusin uh, in the same way that older mice uh, do. So these, uh, these are older mice uh, uh, and these are the, the choroidremia mice. These are very old mice. Um, and, uh, and so uh, and then what we saw morphologically was that there was a number of defects uh, that uh, uh, were similar to what we see uh, or perhaps even more exuberant than what we see in aged mice uh, and in age uh, associated diseases like macular degeneration which is uh, where these, uh, uh, these characteristic uh, uh, defects, uh, this is the, the retinal pigment epithelium, the photoreceptors are here, this is the choroid and at the interface of the RP and choroid there are deposits and malformations uh, like these ones there's uh, thickening of this uh, thickening of this membrane called the Brooks membrane that separates the RPE from uh, the, uh, th this separates from this is a, a, an endothelium here and this is the basal infoldings of the of the basal side of the RPE cell and uh, what we see is a, is, a, is a thickening exactly like we see in age uh, related uh, macular degeneration so just to go quite uh, um, a bit fast here. Uh, the, the conclusions were, uh, are that uh, um, definitely RPE is a disease of memory, uh, uh, choroidremia is a disease of membrane traffic. However, uh, we think uh, it's not due to a single RAB or uh, a single pathway. It's more like an age-related uh, change, a, a change in homeostasis that is drive, uh, driven by the, the partial dysfunctions of uh, several RABs over time that give more of uh, an aging phenotype. So, a lot more complicated than, uh, than we expected uh, uh, when we started uh, this, uh, this project. So let me uh, change gears uh, uh, more into practical applications. And one of the things that the human geneticists have done uh, then over the years was to characterize, that once the gene was known, then it was possible to characterize the mutations. And here we were rather lucky because uh, all the known mutations are loss of function mutations. And, uh, and, uh, and what, uh, uh, so there's been a lot of, uh, many different types of mutations, uh, long uh, deletions to small point mutations, but, uh, but uh, the end result is uh, loss of function mutations. And this uh, uh, obviously uh, led us even uh, in, the, in the late 90s to, to propose uh, that we generated a, a good monoclonal antibody and uh, we had a practical diagnostic test for the disease uh, using just uh, blood cells, a uh, buffy coat, and then do a simple Western blot. And, uh, and this is an example of a Western blot uh, where you have reactivity in a normal individual and uh, no reactivity for REP1. Uh, in uh, choroidremia patient. And this had been used for, for a long time until now the, the, all, the, all the, the DNA sequencing methods are now a lot cheaper and a lot simpler. But, uh, but uh, for a long time uh, doing a simple Western blot is much better than sequencing 15 or, 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 or I don't know how many exons uh, and, um, and introns and, and, and everything else. It's, it's, it's a big gene. So um, 
uh, we moved uh, uh, into uh, what was critical uh, to um, provide uh, um, a, a possible treatment uh, was uh, to mimic uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, mutation uh, in an amenable model. And the mouse has been, uh, as you know, uh, a very commonly used uh, and, and useful uh, model. And the, and the main question that we have uh, uh, for therapy purposes was um, really uh, which layer is the origin of the disease? Because uh, this becomes very important uh, in tissue pathogenesis because you want to know which cells you, want, you need to target uh, to treat because there's no point in targeting photoreceptors if the disease originates in the choroid. Uh, there's no point in treating uh, the RPE if the disease is all in the photoreceptors and it's all what's primary, what's secondary, that's a very important thing. And, uh, and, and, and we had an initial drawback in fact, uh, uh, it was not our group, but uh, the group of uh, Kramers and collaborators, the, the geneticists that actually had uh, isolated the gene uh, in the Netherlands, um, they stumbled on, on something that uh, happens uh, uh, actually, uh, I wouldn't say often, but uh, sometimes, which is uh, that the phenotype in mice uh, is different from the phenotype uh, in humans. And, uh, and in this case, uh, was a much more severe phenotype in that uh, uh, there was lethality. So the female carriers can never transmit the mutant chromosome. And, uh, and this was explained by their group, and I think we have now, uh, our, our work also um, uh, suggested the same, uh, that in fact female uh, carriers can never transmit the mutant chromosome. And the explanation for this is that in mice there's a more strict pattern of X inactivation, and that uh, the maternal X uh, is important for extra embryonic tissue formation. And what happened in these embryos is that the REP1 activity was very important for and, 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 and crucial in the mouse for extra embryonic, uh, well, probably in humans too, but in humans it's compensated by the chimeric, uh, by, the, by the random nature of the X inactivation. So there's enough uh, activity there to keep uh, uh, the, the cells growing. But in, a, in, a, in an environment where all the cells uh, are mutant, uh, then uh, placenta does not uh, uh, develop. So we had to revert uh, to conditional knockouts, and uh, I think uh, we had already uh, several examples of, uh, of, of conditional knockouts uh, here in this meeting. And I was a bit worried about the mixed audience and understanding a conditional knockout, but essentially what you have uh, is that you can uh, uh, induce the, 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 mouse mu the, the mutation uh, in, a, in, a, in a spatially restricted manner or in a temporal uh, restricted manner. In a spatial restricted manner, you put a tissue-specific promoter with a recombinase uh, and the flox mouse, and then depending on the tissue specificity, then you get uh, a, a specific um, uh, mutation uh, in, a, in a certain uh, layer of cells or tissue. And then um, in the temporal, uh, in, in the temporal one, we use that uh, to induce males, floxed males, uh, induce them. Uh, that induction with the drug uh, actually led to germinal cells also recombina recombining, and then the the, fe the mouse, uh, uh, the male mouse, could uh, be mated with a wild type female and give rise to uh, uh, carriers. Okay, female carriers. So we started with uh, female carriers. And we were really uh, uh, happy to see that, uh, that we could um, uh, reproduce uh, in the carriers uh, features of the choroideremia disease, namely photoreceptive degeneration. And photoreceptive degeneration is quite, uh, it's the easiest thing to, uh, to describe because uh, you see the thickness of this, uh, uh, the, th this uh, uh, the outer nuclear layer is just a combination of nuclei of photoreceptors. And, uh, and they have uh, uh, typically 10 rows uh, in uh, a wild-type mouse. 
uh, and then uh, what you see here is uh, an, an eight-month-old uh, mouse uh, had already uh, quite a reduction in the number of uh, nuclei rows. And in some places, given the mosaicism of these uh, carriers, you can actually get uh, much more severe uh, in some areas. The retina was actually severely degenerated already at eight months. But even at eight months, this is, this is reflecting the slow onset degeneration that we see uh, in, the, uh, in the humans. And then we created tissue-specific uh, uh, knockouts. And, uh, uh, and just to summarize a lot of data, uh, what we observed uh, is, uh, and, and we haven't been able to put the choroid uh, in this. We've been really, uh, um, uh, we've been doing work uh, essentially with photoreceptors and RPE because uh, uh, people believe that uh, the choroidal degeneration is secondary to RPE degeneration. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and it's a, a more difficult, uh, for us, it was a bit more difficult to, to tackle that, that problem. So we, we stuck to photoreceptors and RPE. And what we observed was that if we did the photoreceptor specific knockout of the choroidremia gene, the photoreceptors degenerated, but degenerated very, very slow. And, uh, and much slower, extreme, much, much slower than uh, uh, what we observed for the, for the, for the carriers that uh, I showed you. And then, uh, and also, if we did RPE-specific knockouts, uh, then we had degeneration and abnormalities of the RPE, the kinds of uh, things that I showed you before, uh, and others, and actually cell death uh, uh, in the RPE. And then we crossed these two mice, uh, and then uh, what we observed was that in the double knockouts uh, of the photoreceptors and the RPE, then the photoreceptor degeneration was uh, highly enhanced. So the defect in the RPE, uh, although it's a, so, so the idea is that the disease is cell autonomous, okay? Um, but mani manifests itself in the RPE and the photoreceptors independently, okay? However, uh, we think the RPE plays a major role in this pathogenesis because these defects in the RPE greatly accelerate the degeneration of uh, photoreceptors. And for, gen uh, and for gene therapy purposes, there's uh, some obvious conclusions uh, that uh, you should treat both layers uh, if you can. But even if you don't, uh, then uh, focus on the RPE. And, uh, and if you treat the RPE, you can already have some uh, improvement. So the next uh, uh, steps uh, were really to try to provide preclinical data to support uh, uh, a clinical trial. And, uh, and here again, I think we were uh, a bit lucky because uh, the eye uh, is, in terms of solid tissues, perhaps the best uh, model for uh, these pioneering studies in either gene therapy or regenerative medicine uh, for the reasons that I explained here. I mean, this is in addition to a hematopoietic system, which has been uh, obviously has uh, advantages and will always have the advantages. But in terms of solid tissues, uh, the, the eye is, uh, is, uh, is very appealing. Um, first, because it's small. And uh, you may think this is a, an insignificant thing. This is probably the most important uh, characteristics, is that uh, these treatments are extremely expensive. And, uh, and the ability to transduce uh, uh, cells, uh, the number of cells, is a very important limiting factor. So if you're talking about a few thousand cells, or a few uh, tens of thousand cells is a completely different proposition than trillions of cells in the liver or trillions of cells in the in the in the brain, for example, or in the muscle. Okay, so this is or in the lung. Uh, so this is a completely uh, different ball game, basically. Then it's accessible. Uh, now there's amazing techniques, OCT, where it's like a laser confocal microscopy in vivo, uh, where you see all the layers of the retina in vivo in patients, and you can repeatedly do this uh, over the course. So you know exactly how about retinal structure in a lot of detail. Um, uh, with uh, these accessible uh, techniques. Then there's some immune privilege uh, in the eye. And, uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, it's an important organ, but not a vital organ. So the patient will not die 
the worst that can happen is that it will get blind, uh, which is uh, very dramatic, of course, but it's not the same as the patient actually dying. And as a bonus, it's a symmetric organ, so you have a control uh, in, in your experiments. So uh, what we did was uh, really uh, something that was not uh, particularly uh, innovative um, because I think that uh, one of the things that uh, we're used uh, as basic scientists is to always look for the very novel things and, the, and I think for technology and for applications, uh, it's actually the plus is on the beaten track because there's so much uh, more confidence than uh, out there for a certain product, uh, for a certain utilization, or even for licensing and things like that, uh, uh, for going through uh, gene therapy regulatory committees. Uh, the more it's known about the, these things, the better. So we stuck with, uh, with what was uh, well known, and we knew that uh, uh, standard AAV2s would infect RPE and photoreceptors. They provide efficient gene expression, and they are safer than other, uh, the other um, uh, uh, viral vectors because they're non-integrating in the genome. So what is it? Um, what is the purpose of this? The purpose of this is to do a subretinal injection. And what is a subretinal injection? Is an injection where uh, you put in the virus between the photoreceptors and the RPE. You create an artificial retinal detachment that will reabsorb uh, within a few days. And, uh, and in fact, uh, before we got into humans, we had to do this in mice. And in mice, it's a lot more problematic because the eye is so small. So I'm going to show you here uh, the technique. So the first thing is you dilate uh, the, the iris uh, of the mouse. Uh, it's, uh, 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 and then uh, here was just for visualization. And once the cover slip is there and you focus, you can see the fundus, yeah? You see the fundus of the, of the eye. <coughs> and then you go in with the smallest needle available, but it's huge uh, for the mice. And uh, you have to find the subretinal space. We added a dye so that we could control uh, the injection and see that we actually were injecting in the right place. And, uh, and here, this is a huge subretinal injection. About half the eye has been uh, detached and, uh, and, and used in this uh, and, uh, and, and transduced uh, with virus. You won't do this uh, uh, in humans necessarily, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but this is possible uh, to do uh, in the mouse. And so we did uh, the obvious experiments. We showed, uh, first of all, that, uh, that there was expression. And, uh, and we could see, we could show, uh, actually, these are not uh, bisystronic uh, uh, vectors. We use the GFP uh, as a surrogate for the REP1. Uh, so these are GFP uh, viruses that infect uh, the RPE and the photoreceptors uh, and, and, uh, and a higher magnification here, uh, clearly nuclei from photoreceptors. And, uh, and this is very much what has been described for other genes, uh, there's variability, the photoreceptors take up some, the RPE takes very well, and uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, viral vector. And, uh, but also we showed with the real vectors that uh, you could get expression, and we could also show activity of this, um, of this, um, uh, of this uh, newly um, uh, introduced uh, uh, gene uh, inside the, the retina. Uh, this is also something we were able to do once we were uh, collaborating with, oft with an ophthalmologist, uh, because this is a human retinal explant uh, that, uh, drive, uh, that was uh, uh, obtained from a surgery. Uh, normally you don't remove a retina in a surgery, but this patient had a special disease that had to actually remove the, sur the, 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 the retina, and instead of uh, uh, throwing it to the, to the bin, we used it uh, as uh, uh, and, and, and add our viruses to this and did some experiments to show. And we showed that in the human retina, uh, we could see similarities in terms of transduction of the, viral, of the virus than we observed uh, in the mouse, which is always uh, an interesting thing uh, that, uh, <coughs> to add. So 
AAV rep one subretinal injection leads to production of active protein in RPE and photoreceptors, and uh, and and the function analysis was a bit more tricky. Uh, I mean, I could show you, but I don't. Even I don't understand them very well. It's uh, electroretinograms and uh, and and vision uh, um, uh, physiological assays, and you see small differences. But the, but the mice are not uh, heavily uh, affected in the first place, so it's a bit hard to. Show show actually uh, the, um, uh, the, the differences between the two. But, but, but we can, uh, the experts said the, that the, there were uh, noticeable uh, improvements uh, in those. It's just I cannot explain them very well. So I pass on that and believe me, believe me when I say that. So actually, uh, around 1990, uh, around 2010, we were now ready to uh, embark on uh, uh, human uh, clinical trials. And at this point, really, um, uh, and this is a reflection, so I have a really a confession, a confession to make, uh, uh, is that the, the, the mouse studies that we did that we thought would be absolutely critical and very important were actually not that important. Uh, and uh, and uh, I mean, they were not irrelevant, but what the people in the committees were worried about was about safety. And things that we are uh, actually think are really trivial, uh, like a degree of overexpression <coughs> in mammalian cells and tissues and uh, uh, possible deleterious effects and, and things like that. Uh, these are the things that really the, the, the regulatory committees were really uh, on us. So we could actually progress uh, uh, in a lot of this, uh, uh, in the preparation of the clinical trial, even before we had full uh, data. Of course, we had some data, uh, but for example, functional tests in mice uh, uh, were not necessary, and they never asked uh, for that. Uh, because uh, the phase one clinical trials are all about safety anyway, not about efficacy. So, and then they say, well, the, the mouse is not, th that's how the ophthalmologists tell the mouse, mouse, they don't even have a macula, and then what's that? They're not. Uh, they're not humans, the real proof is human. So I think that uh, uh, we really uh, need to uh, uh, talk to other people because uh, sometimes uh, the path is uh, simpler than we expected uh, that, uh, that, that it would be. So these are the kinds of things they really like uh, to see is uh, activity blots uh, and show that the activity was there. Um, uh, Levels of overexpression were very important because there was this precedent with cystic fibrosis that the overexpression of the cystic fibrosis gene was also toxic to cells. So there was a problem with underexpression, but there was also a problem with overexpression. In this case, we were able to show very clearly that even if we wanted, we could never really push the expression very high <coughs> on this. Uh, on uh, uh, the cells had controls uh, on how much protein they make. And there was no obvious deleterious effects uh, on the on the expression of the protein. So we were ready for a clinical trial, and then uh, and, uh, and you know took quite a while to get through uh, the regulatory committees, and also for the funding because uh, it's not trivial to get uh, AAV viruses produced uh, in GMP uh, facilities and, and in quality for, for, for human uh, use. So that was all, uh, <coughs> uh, that was all, and all needed to be uh, sorted out. And, uh, and the initial um, uh, trial was actually quite uh, uh, low key. I mean, there were 12 patients uh, with uh, actually, several. Um, then this was a little bit changed. There were several doses uh, of the vectors, and the ophthalmologist was very concerned, and so he was very um, conservative in the amount of uh, virus that uh, you put in, and he would rather put less, and then increase than the other way around, and having problems with excess uh, virus. So what we found is that uh, he started off with. Um, uh, smaller amounts, and then, and then, as he titrated uh, um, and, and put more, there was a bit more effect. So, so uh, um, it was um, uh, it was worthwhile to 
proceed. Uh, and, uh, and the summaries of these um, are, um, you know, very specialist things and uh, ophthalmology uh, types of tests uh, in patients. But I just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, in, uh, in these cases, uh, 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 here, in, in this patient, there was a, a great increase in visual acuity, okay? There's some effect on the non-treated eye, and that seems to be uh, some sort of reaction, cerebral uh, reaction to seeing better in this eye, but, uh, but still it was significantly different. Uh, uh, this is letters read on the ophthalmologist, okay, so you go there and say A, B, C, D, E, and, this, and they can go and see another 21 letters. That's a huge improvement on, uh, on this. And then this patient also had an improvement of plus 11 letters and, uh, and the, the treated eye. Uh, continue to uh, degrade a little bit uh, over the course uh, of these studies. But, but to summarize this and, uh, uh, was that the two most advanced patients had substantial gains uh, in visual activity uh, and then uh, most of them have improvement of maximum retinal sensitivity in the treated eyes. Uh, but the important thing here was that uh, if you, it, the, it was this very advanced cases. These are patients that have very, very, retin very little retina left. And in those cases, uh, when you have very little retina left, you're close to blindness. So, uh, and in this case, you could see definitely the patients, uh, and if I have time, I actually have a, a, a movie of a patient describing uh, how he feels, um, that uh, there were, there were um, uh, amazing um, improvements of function. This is not the expected thing in, 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 in a gene therapy. But actually proof that this uh, uh, had happened, this improving function, uh, came from studies like this, where this, was a, this is a variable fixation study. So these uh, dots that you see here in, in blue are, uh, are, are parts of the retina that are active and are transducing electrical signals essentially, okay? And, uh, and what does, um, this is the pre-surgery of that retina that is really heavily compromised. This is the macula here and even the macula has very little retina left. There's a little island of, of retina left here. And what happened post-surgery is that this thing is shifted into an area that was previously not uh, really uh, responsive. And uh, so uh, what, uh, what we think uh, uh, has happened uh, in this case is that, uh, is that the rescue uh, of the, of the, of the, uh, with, the, with the addition of the choroideremia protein um, leads to rescue of these cells that are alive but, not, but inactive. So this is almost like a resuscitation of cells, you know, cells that are, but they're not dead because they can recover function, but they were already so compromised that they would not be working on, on, on phototransduction. Uh, uh, and that's probably, that was the, the most rewarding part of it. The other uh, rewarding part was that in the rest of the patients, there was a tendency uh, for the treated eye. In most cases, the treated eye stopped degenerating, as we predicted, while the control eye continued to degenerate slowly, as, as predicted. And these patients have now been followed for five years, and uh, especially in these cases of, uh, of uh, uh, severe loss, uh, these two patients, uh, they continue to, uh, uh, to do well, and uh, they have not uh, degraded um, uh, further uh, from that initial uh, re, uh, uh, improvement uh, of the of the um, of, of vision. So uh, what, we, what we have here is really um, uh, 25 years from discovery to treatment, uh, where we spent uh, um, like 15 years in fundamental research. Uh, a lot of it actually. Uh, quite irrelevant for the final uh, for the final uh, result. Um, uh, we spent some time in translational uh, research, and now since 2011 in clinical research, which has been um, in the hands of uh, investigator-led. Uh, so this is uh, this was us uh, on the phase one trial. There's now four. 
uh, investigator led independent clinical trials in four different countries, in the UK, in Germany, in the US, uh, and in Canada. And, uh, but now, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the next step is definitely with a company, uh, with the companies, and uh, because uh, uh, the, the, the next uh, step is to license uh, this, uh, uh, this, um, this, um, uh, th this treatment. And just this week, um, uh, I just, uh, uh, it was just uh, this week, uh, the company uh, that uh, was uh, spinned uh, out of this uh, study, it's called Nightstar, and the reason why it's called Nightstar is because uh, one of the patients described uh, after the trial that he had seen stars at night, and that there was something that um, uh, he hadn't seen for years, and that he was a, an, an amateur astronomer, and he really was in love with stars, and that uh, he could never see this. And, uh, and what we, they just uh, announced on Monday, uh, with the beginning of this meeting, I think, uh, it was good, Omar, uh, that uh, they announced the initiation of a phase three uh, trial for, uh, for quadremia. So um, I'm pretty confident that uh, if things go well, uh, as they have in the phase one, two uh, trials that have been, that uh, this will be an off-the-shelf uh, um, uh, curative treatment for these patients uh, uh, in, the uh, in, in uh, maybe three years, okay? And then we have 30 years to licensing in the, from a gene identification. <laughs> so let me just finish with, uh, with two um, sort of offsides. We we're a bit, uh, I was fine. I was not interrupted, so. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not allowed to interrupt me. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, what's the negative control? And something that you know it's now working, isn't that unethical to have a negative control? Yeah, the negative control. No, no, no. The negative control is the, is the non-treated eye. But that's unethical. You should give vision to both eyes. No, 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 no. Or that's not. No, 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 no. No. no, no. On the contrary, that's not an. No, it's not at all. Actually, uh, if something goes wrong, you only screw up one eye. No, no, no. It, it's it's a lot safer. Of course, of course, of course. These patients came out of the trial and they said, please do me the other one fast before I lose the eye. But that's well, not... I actually, would like to make a point. I have vision in only one eye, partial vision in the other. And I'm very sensitive to that matter. So I'm not sure that I would agree with that. Well, uh, it's not me. Uh, it's the regulatory committees and the, what's uh, sort of standard ethics, so we can, we can discuss that. Uh, but but, but it, is, it is a safety precaution. That, uh, and now, of course, these patients are number one to get uh, the treatment of the second eye, and yet that's probably also unethical, or, or not, uh, not unethical, but not fair. Because why would three patients in the world get a full recovery while uh, thousands of other ones are still waiting for the for the trial? So at least uh, you know, at least you you have one eye going uh, for uh, or better for, for that. But we can discuss that. Uh, um, so let me just finish with two sort of off the wall uh, bit. We're in a nice environment here, so I thought I'd bring this. One is this uh, aspect. Uh, uh, it's, this disease was not really fundable by the main funders. And, the, and what drove uh, a lot of this uh, research were the patients themselves. So in this case, uh, you could say that the patients themselves changed their own future. Uh, because these associations, uh, this was a more well-known and bigger foundation that supported us in the beginning. But these foundations, uh, and this one is also a, a, a UK-based foundation, but we have a specific family that <coughs> uses Fight for Sight and says, and donates this money specifically for Croidremia research uh, uh, in, in, in my lab. Um, but the Croidremia Research Foundation is a, is a, is a, a new, um, well, it's, it was uh, begun about 15 years ago and has increasingly um, uh, increasing fundraising power and, uh, and, and really uh, they can do a lot of things. And then with the success of the trials, they're even more excited and more, they were already quite active, now they're super active. So let me just finish by, uh, by acknowledging one, um, very talented postdoc that did 
absolutely almost 90% of this work. Uh, Tanya Tomachoma, and she uh, was in my lab for uh, 17 <laughs> years, which is a bit unusual. She's a senior postdoc. She never wanted to leave, and she never wanted to be independent, so uh, she stayed, and, uh, and, and this was the end result. Thank you very much. Which AAV are you using? Which type? Because you might be able to increase the efficiency. Hmm. Because the AAV, there are different types, yeah. which are specific for different cells. Yes. Uh, so, what? <coughs> which AAV? Yeah. We yeah. Uh, we tried AV22 and 25, and right. and uh, and now there's all series of uh, new AVs and all that. Uh, the trade-off, as I explained, was. Um, in terms of speed, you want to piggyback on things that are well covered. And, uh, and so, because every time you change something, you have to start from scratch and you have to do a lot of work. So, we compromised uh, perhaps a slightly lower efficiency with photoreceptors, but we had enough uh, there in terms of the photoreceptors because we think the RPE is even more critical and that is more easy to transduce. And uh, so, we didn't think that uh, the trade off was to use that one and speed up the process because we could piggyback on a lot of uh, other work. <laughs> so Miguel, maybe not so important, but do you know why RET2 cannot complement RET1 in the retina? Well, yeah, we, 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 oh, we know why it does not complement. Yeah, no, it's still a mystery. So it's, it's expressed in RAP2, RAP2? It, it's, again, RAP2 is expressed, yeah, yeah. Rep yeah, rep two is expressed, but it's expressed uh, in most uh, in most other places, uh, in 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 all other places. As we, as we know, they're both ubiquitous proteins. And uh, why the degeneration of the retina? That's a very good question. Uh, I need another twenty years to uh, come <laughs> back and and tell you that. Uh, uh, we don't know. It's still a mystery. From what I mean, uh, this is a good. I, I think the first talk this morning was quite interesting in that uh, I think uh, Rudy was, was referring to the same thing. The complexity and the prediction. You cannot predict. I would have predicted that uh, you know, a single rub would be retinal specific rub was very important in the retina and nowhere else. Uh, and that was a beautiful hypothesis, but it's completely wrong. Uh, it's just so much more uh, complex and difficult than, uh, than, than we expected, uh, that, uh, that it's still a mystery. So, <coughs> the virus is replicating in this? No. No, no. no. It's, it's, it's not no. Replicating. Integrate actually in a specific site yeah. on the DNA. Specific site on the DNA. Yeah. It doesn't really integrate, right? It uh, does, it does actually. Yeah. AV integrated. Yeah. Otherwise, you will not get expression for a long time. No, but you have this attachment. Uh, no, no, it uh, has an integrated, it has a site, specific site, okay. where it integrates. And then the new cells have it. Yeah, so, so the, trick, the trick here in this, that's why it's, uh, it's hard to make. If, if the virus was replicating, it would be very easy to produce because the virus itself would be millions of copies of this and would be no problem. But what you do is you remove the replicative genes and in that tight space, you put in your transgene, okay? So you use that space to put your transgene and uh, that creates a, a, a much safer virus. But that creates problems in producing the virus because they're not replicating. So you have to be always transforming cells. So when, when the virus was injected, <coughs> Is it, a, I mean, is it a very local injection or always a local injection is not propagating to the whole retina, right? No, no, it's just on the, on the side, it depends on the size of the retinal detachment. So it depends on the size of the fluid, on the, on the volume of the fluid that you inject. So if you inject a larger fluid, you create a larger detachment. If you, if you inject less fluid, you, you create less detachment, but actually, there are a number of issues here because a lot of these retinas are fibrotic because they are completely degenerative. So one of the major problems with the surgery was, are these retinas going to break? Um, they're not elastic enough 
and and uh, and and so the surgeons, uh, the, the surgeon McLaren is really uh, uh, testing that, and uh, and he's so far he's seen no problem. So are there viruses? <coughs> are these viruses specific for this? Cells? I mean, I think no, 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 not at all. No, no, no. They're quite so widely used. Different types. Some type works better for certain cells than others. So that's yeah. the reason I asked the question, because you can find maybe type of AV that works oh, better. Oh yeah, no. I think AV8 works better for photoreceptors, for example. Okay. Yeah, you know, it, there, there are there are some studies. These ones are quite widely uh, uh, have a wide tropism and uh, and they can be can can affect many cells. Um, yeah. Um, the the other issue now is with patients, is how many of these treatments are you going to make? Because everyone is a surgery, a major surgery. Yeah. So uh, how much of a detachment and how early do you go? So that's a real consideration. But that's what I was asking. If, if you're going to a further development, if you would choose a virus that has decent specificity for it. No, but the, but the RPE is fine. The RPE is fine. And, uh, no, 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 but I meant you could then put it in the, blood, in the circulation, right? Ah, no, no, no. Uh, no, because then you would risk a lot of problems uh, because the eye is circum circumscribed so you, uh, even so, the patients get uh, uh, anti-inflammatory, uh, they get cortisone uh, to prevent, uh, and, and one or two patients actually develop a bit of an inflammatory uh, disease. <coughs> so the more constrained you shouldn't be, if you don't have to, then you shouldn't be putting this thing on the blood, on the bloodstream. Yeah. No, it's not. Yeah. Yes. So I was wondering what your ideas are and why, what would make this more effective? Um, and uh, also, is there a stem cell population that um, would regenerate the retina? And is there, yeah. are there any attempts on going on to use that kind of strategy, stem cell mm -hmm. strategy? So I, I, I think this is not the end of it because I think for all these practical reasons and costs and, and, and all the rest, uh, we haven't even touched the cost, uh, but <coughs> that's another important uh, thing. But, but in a situation like this, if the effect is really for 20, 30 years, the economic benefit is, is there. So you just invest initially, but then that, that patient uh, is not a patient. It becomes a person and uh, is, continues to be active and productive. <coughs> so that's, uh, there's a benefit there. But this is probably never going to be uh, a situation where you absolutely prevent any degeneration and these uh, people have a completely normal uh, vision, okay? Um, that is not gonna happen. Also, you have the cases of those that have already gone too far and, uh, and that gene therapy is not, uh, is not an option. So, obviously, uh, retinal um, uh, uh, cell therapy, uh, regenerative uh, therapies are obviously uh, there. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's been even some uh, RPE transplants uh, for macular degeneration, which is a much more common disease. And, uh, and the RPE there seems to be the key um, layer involved. And there, uh, so you create a monolayer of, of RPE on a little scaffold and then you patch it somehow uh, r surgically and uh, uh, remove the, the disease, the RPE, and you put that patch in. And the, the Japanese have already been uh, doing that and there are other trials planned, uh, but not photoreceptors. So far, uh, the photoreceptors are much more difficult. People are doing some cavalier experiments of trying to put some progenitors and things, but that's not been, like in many other situations, they've not been uh, uh, effective. Is the eye immunologically privileged? I mean, if, would there be rejection? Is the eye what? Is, would, would there be rejection? I assume uh -huh. that, I don't know where they're getting these. Uh, well, there is some immune privilege. Um, uh, I, nobody knows. Uh, uh, at least it's a little bit protected uh, from, uh, from rejection more than, other, more than other tissues. Again, uh, one of the advantages of the eye. What we are uh, quite interested is in the now in the mechanisms of cell death 
um, because nobody really understands uh, further about this part. I mean, along the lines of what Bruno was asking, but more specifically, how the cells die and what are the pathways that are activated because what we could is potentially consider perhaps some pharmacological treatments that would delay, you know, I mean it's all about the delaying game, right? Uh, and trying to get uh, more delayed while at the same time permitting the, the, the gene therapy to to keep uh, uh, a pool of cells uh, in, in good condition. So, so there's a combination of things that, uh, that are still very much possible. This is not the end of the story, but what it is is that uh, is you have to realize that, uh, that these people are diagnosed uh, when they're 10 years old and they're told that you're gonna be blind uh, and there's nothing we can do. And, uh, and that uh, story changed and uh, that fortunately that's, uh, that's good. Stop this now, take two minutes and thank you. Okay. <laughs>